Adams Optics asks, what is the relationship between science and philosophy? Big question because science is a very big domain and so is philosophy. The short answer is that I think that philosophy and science overlap. In the work that I have done and am doing, the role of philosophy and my philosophy colleague, if you like, is um, to bring to bring coherence and rigour to scientific statements. I mean, I think there are some scientific um, areas in which philosophical questions do very naturally arise, um, and the and the input of philosophers is is valued by some of the people working in those sciences. Philosophy has contributed to zero to science, and my experience with philosophy in general, and, and I have come across philosophers, is that they're very clever, mm. but have absolutely nothing of interest to say. Nothing. There are pop scientists who decry philosophy and say that it's worthless and irrelevant as a discipline, and I think the reason why they say that kind of thing, well, it may be a kind of Anglo-Saxon, well, British anti-intellectualism, and philosophers are seen as an archetype of intellectuals, so it's always good to beat them up. You know, they're not very practical people, and we don't really like that. But also I think that there's a genuine reaction by some scientists against philosophers seeming to trespass upon their area. So I think a scientist would look at an introductory metaphysics book that debates the nature of space and time, right. and say, what do they think they're playing at? And don't they realise that physics has told us all about space and time? I would say that I see what we're trying to do in philosophy of science as falling, the questions we address as falling into three broad categories. So on the one hand, we have general questions about scientific methodology, about the patterns of reasoning you find in science, about how the process of collecting evidence for a scientific hypothesis works. What is science? What makes science distinctive? How does science differ from other forms of inquiry? Mm. How does science make progress? Is science rational? Um, does science straightforwardly accumulate knowledge or does it sometimes also throw away knowledge and kind of jump around? Are there revolutions in science? Lots and lots of questions like that. Then we find a second category of questions which one might describe as foundational questions within particular sciences. Um, so, for example, within physics, then we find discussion of certain key concepts such as space-time. Um, within biology, we find discussions of concepts such as species or gene. Um, and the, the, the aim there is rather different. So the aim there is to try and take a troublesome scientific concept um, or, and elucidate it by the, using philosophical techniques. Now, clearly inquiry of that sort is not really separable entirely from the theoretical end of the science itself. You could call it sort of future-orientated history of science. That is, the philosophers study the theories we've already got, or the theories that we've had for a while. They're not primarily concerned with developing new theories, but they are concerned with understanding what we should really think about things, not just what people in the past thought about them or what, what the theory currently says about them. A third category of question arises when we utilise scientific results and theories to try and illuminate traditional philosophical matters. So, for example, if you think of traditional philosophical debates about free will, about the nature of morality, or political philosophy, about the relationship between individual and society, um, or metaphysical debates about the, the fundamental constituents of reality of matter, say, then increasingly one finds philosophers still interested in addressing those questions that we've looked at from antiquity, in, in philosophy, but utilising the results of modern science. One might wonder the, about the relationship between the emotions and reason okay. in a, a way that connects with hundreds and thousands of years of discussion of that matter in philosophy. But one would do it in the light of the latest findings of cognitive science, in the light of trying to interpret you know, 
different theories of the emotions in cognitive science. Well, tell me of an example of a philosopher that made any interesting contribution to anything. Well, Isaac Newton was not a philosopher. He was a natural philosopher. No, he was a brilliant scientist. Well, Nothing philosophical about Newton. But he was called a natural philosopher. Well, the bank can call anybody what you like, but he wasn't a philosopher, he was a brilliant scientist. The reason I think people often say historically they're the same is because we see that we now regard as separate sciences were once part of philosophy. Mm. So, could argue computer science is the most recent such example. Um, and of course, there wasn't computer science before there were computers, but there's parts of computer science that you know, logic and artificial languages, which were in the domain of philosophy before computer science was a separate subject. And another recent example is psychology, where um, people used to have chairs in philosophy and psychology, and then psychology became a separate subject. But if we go back earlier, then you could say the same thing about about physics. I mean, if you look at people like Newton, like Einstein, for example, then, I mean, leading physicists of their day, they were, you know, intensely interested in, in philosophical questions about the limits of scientific knowledge, mm. about scientific method. Newton wrote extensively about the, um, how, how scientific inference should, should go. Um, so in those days, you certainly saw a more intimate connection between science and philosophy than you do now, where philosophy of science is a sort of professionalised um, arena that doesn't necessarily interact directly or influence directly the practice of science um, despite our best efforts. I mean, it does a bit, but um, perhaps, perhaps less than one might want. The one philosopher I'm absolutely against is, of course, Popper. Oh, no, why? Why? Oh, because he thinks that the essence of science is falsifiability, and that's just rubbish. And I think the important thing to realise about science is it's simply based on evidence, explanations, and internal consistency. You don't need any philosophy to explain science. Well, philosophers love logic, and logic is about seeking internal consistency, right? Well... There is this area of complexity sciences, it's been around for, well, about 30 years, hmm. probably. Um, and it's an exciting area, and it... it, it, it Affects areas, you know, biology, chemistry, um, social sciences, economics. But when you ask people what is complexity sciences or what is complexity or what is a complex system, you get these, you know, these basically as many answers as you ask people. And philosophy, the, the way I've experienced it, is looking at all these statements and ask, are they actually all talking about the same thing? Are they contradicting each other? Um, and it matters because if we can't really, sort of an indicator, if we can't really talk about what is the system we're studying, you know, what is it, then that is a signal, a signature that we don't really understand what the system is. Okay. So it's like shining a light on these, on these different statements and then philosophy comes along and realizes actually there's some, something that's not logical here. Because either you're right or you're right. Can't be both. But I don't think philosophers work on science. Um, Listen, I work in developmental biology, so hmm. there's not a single philosopher working on developmental biology. And that's the way you come from a single cell. Hmm. You know, the, it is amazing that you were once this tiny little bloody cell. Yeah. And that's not philosophy, that's science. Um, well, here's an example. I mean, think about the way that the concept of a species is understood. I mean, the concept of a species plays a key role in the biological sciences. If you pick up, pick up any, any biology textbook, then it'll, um, you know, particularly if it's, if it's about um, natural history, for example, or evolutionary biology, it'll be replete with descriptions of uh, references to particular species. But then a, a natural question to, to ask is, well, what, what exactly is a species? I mean, what do we mean by that? Now, that's clearly a question that is internal to the science in a sense and that biologists have long raised. However, it, all, it also poses an overarching philosophical issue that, is, uh, that philosophers have thought about since Aristotle's day, which is whether the, the general categories that we use in describing the world, of which they 
species as one, are meant to carve nature at its joints, mm. to use Plato's expression. So are they um, latching onto pre-existing divisions that are out there in the world, or are these just human classification schemes that we've imposed on reality for our own practical purposes? Um, and I think that's a question that very natural to, to ask about species. I mean, are these divisions really out there in the world, or have biologists just sort of superimposed mm. um, the, the, these classificatory distinctions of, of taxonomy onto a seamless, um, a seamless reality, if you like? Uh, in the case of philosophy of physics, philosophy of physics asks questions like, how do we regard different mathematical formulations of the same theory? Should we think of them as really just the same theory, or should we think of them as as in embodying different foundational ideas or as conceptually different uh, and much more specific questions like should we believe that wave functions uh, in quantum mechanics represent real things how should we solve the measurement problem in quantum mechanics is causation in the physical world local are space and time fundamental maybe time is an illusion as Julian Barber argues so the philosophy of physics is about the big questions that physics itself asks, and it seeks to answer them by carefully analysing our best physical theories. So it's one big project, if you like, that I'm working on with a philosophy colleague, James Lagerman. So we tried to inject some order into these uh, disordered statements. Okay. Um, and that's we're, we're still doing that. And uh, I know scientists are reading this work, so they are wanting to know, too, what we come up with. The, the kinds of questions you're talking about, they're philosophical questions because they wouldn't be neatly decided by experiment. And, and what I'd like to know is what can decide the answer to those questions? By what criterion is a good answer derived in philosophy of physics? Good. OK. They, they can't be decided but directly by experiment, but Usually, I think the way that philosophical questions get answered in science is they particular answers to a philosophical question are associated with particular research programs. And if those research programs die out and get replaced by other ones that have implicitly different answers to those questions, mm. then we think of the questions being answered by that process. So, for example, there's a philosophical question about whether the biological and the chemical are reducible to the physical. Okay. And there were people who proposed vital forces in biology and special kinds of chemical forces to explain chemical bonding. Those philosophical views were associated with scientific research programs. Mm. Those scientific research programs failed, and the scientific research program that interpreted biological processes as biochemical processes and ultimately as chemical processes and, 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 and that saw no need for vital forces and tried to explain um, the processes of life in terms of ordinary physics and chemistry were successful and the research program that analysed the chemical bond in terms of physics, basically in terms of electromagnetism, was also successful. And so I think we get a straight refutation of this, of any metaphysical view, but we do get kind of evidence that suggests that that's a not a productive way to think about the world. Now, this is entirely what you're working on, but I want to know, what is a complex system? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if I had a short answer, well, I, I, do have, I do have a short answer. Might need more explanation, but a short answer is a complex system is a system that consists of many elements. Mm -hmm. The elements are interacting with each other, and there is disorder in the system and there is order generated through the interaction of these elements and that order is what we would call um, an emergent structure or an emergent behaviour. And it's your contention that there are these striking similarities between ant colonies and brains and mm. economies and all kinds of things in the natural world. Mm. Um, would you care to hazard a guess why on earth those patterns crop up everywhere? Yeah. We can abstract these systems, all of them, and we can abstract them to elements, many of them interacting, 
and and the fascinating thing is that the the interaction can be you know can be vastly different things. It can mm. be bees communicating through the wire nets. Mm. That's an interaction because they're exchanging information and then it changes their behaviour. Um, or an interaction can be um, a transmission of disease, shall we say, in a society, in a, in a group of people. Um, that's an exchange of microbes or bacteria or viruses or whatever. Um, so, in, but in the abstract sense, they're the same thing. It's two entities that are interacting, and the interaction could be abstract, like information. It could be something concrete, like energy or, mm. or matter. But in the abstract, it's all the same. So why shouldn't the result be similar as well? So you've looked right. at these things interacting, and from that interaction, you get a higher level order. Now, that higher level order could then be you know, the outbreak of an epidemic, mm. or it could be the decision which nest are the bees gonna, which nest site are the bees gonna choose? That's putting a color on the abstract um, entity of interaction leading to order. Right. So once you strip that away, it's sort of, of course, why not? I mean, because <laughs> we're talking about the same thing. Now it's interacting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and whether it's physical interaction or, or, writing a newspaper article. Wow, so you just made this really bizarre thing sound totally obvious. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> the, the way you're describing it makes it sound like philosophy can help us construct a kind of human user interface for this rather alien set of... Sort yeah, of I mean, I, th I think that's a good way of thinking about it. And I mean, you, and you might think, isn't that just popularising science? But... I think it's more than that for the following reason. Uh, so, for example, quantum mechanics is probably a, a case in point where there are genuinely puzzling questions about the picture of reality that the science presents us. So I think of, I think of them as being a number of specific areas where the science itself does either cry out for philosophical conceptual clarification or um, potentially shake our sort of pre-scientific everyday view of the world so dramatically that something needs to be said about how the science and the and the everyday beliefs hang together. Reading your books, you are reflecting on the nature of science, you're reflecting on the method of science, you're reflecting on the import of science for our world view. Oh yes, I certainly um, look on the effect of science on our lives, but that's not philosophy. You regard that, you know, on the ethical issues related to science, you regard that as philosophical. Um, I certainly do, but I was also talking about the kind of metaphysical import. Like, um, you write about the way that um, science is radically counterintuitive. Yes. Um, and that we, we, mustn't, right. we mustn't trust our intuitions about anything. Well, it just makes it... The real point I'm making there is for non-scientists, quite difficult to understand science. Hmm. Of course, it goes against common sense. Hmm. Uh, but So you write about these things, and... I would call you a philosopher of science, to be cheeky I could sue you. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of the Centre for Science and Philosophy is that it not just brings together scientists and philosophers, but it also acts as a forum for public engagement, for bringing questions at the interface of science and philosophy to a broader audience. And it also provides um, resources through the website uh, for people to, who are interested in those questions to to use to find out more about how to find out more about them. So, yes, it's about the overlap between science and philosophy, the nature of science and um, the nature of philosophy of science too.